So we'll start with a quote. The goal of therapy or any program of growth for one with a personality disorder must be maturation and integration. And with that, I introduce Dr. Fu. <laughs> That's supposed to be an introduction. Do you want me to comment on that? <laughs> Your whole thing is integration. Oh, yeah, that's nice. I would say that I'm deriving from the quote, not the other way around. I can't claim any credit for that. Whose quote is that? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Is it yours? No, but I'm just saying. Huh. I, I'm, integration is, seems to be the theme of this podcast. I found oh, a quote I with integration. Go that far. I'm gonna... Oh, come on. I know I'm giving you a hard time here. Look, I, I don't know if it's the theme of the podcast. I think it should be the theme of treatment, work, in general. That's what I'm going to go after. And certainly, I'm not going to take any uh, personal credit for that. That This is something that you're going to see across disciplines. Yeah, but you um, could take personal credit for, for having it be what you cling to, the thing that, that sticks cling with you. Cling to? Wow, that's a little... Oh, you, you, know. you hate how that. Could you, this how, is the second time On the time theme of personality you. disorders, how could you, Dr. Malzberg, accuse me of such an awful thing? To cling to people, you must hate me. Oh my God, you're killing me. <laughs> All right, we're starting the podcast. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start so, with some yeah. softball questions that are very hard. Okay, and again, to uh, get under your skin, I actually do want to go back to that quote a bit. I, I, I do think that it's funny because it's very important to talk about maturation and integration when you think about personality disorders, yet it's baked in, right? And I'm guessing I'm going to predict your first question being, what is a personality disorder? And I would Wrong. say- Wrong. What's that? Wrong. Okay. Well, then, anyway, the point is, <laughs> what is it? I think it functionally is a lack of maturation and integration. And so that is the core pathology. And so that's going to be the core treatment. Anyway, what was going to be the question? What is personality? Ah, good question. Hard to define. I think most people outside of personality researchers would struggle to define this too. It doesn't help that there's actually two very different ways to think about it. We basically, it, easiest way to talk about this is that we can boil it down to normal and abnormal psychology, right? First, we encounter the concept of personalities that are disordered or pathological, right? That's more from the world of psychiatry from the clinic, from the consulting room, from psychoanalysis. And then we also have the concept of normal psychology, trying to characterize and quantify differences and trends in personality across the general population seen today in the ocean traits. So what is personality? Personality is just the habits of who you are, how you do things, how you relate, think, and feel about yourself and others, that are present from early on in development, but are also developed in development that get you to who you are today. And how you choose to quantify that depends on the researcher or the thinker. Okay, I like that. Um, can you walk us through, the, the, I know these are huge questions, so I know they're overwhelming. How do you understand how personality develops? How does an adult personality develop from childhood things? Wow, development itself. Um, basically, I like to use the framework, and this is a very standard framework, of thinking that we all come with a temperament, hearkening back to our first podcast. You all come with a temperament. That's everybody. There's mm -hmm. a certain way that we respond intrinsically to different environmental and internal experiences. And that's temperament. Okay. And then... On top of that, you begin to build the way you relate to yourself and others early on. Some people think in infancy, right? The first year. Some people think primarily up to the age of four or six. But I, I would basically say it doesn't stop. You Right away, you begin to interact with other people. That's the key part. So you start with temperament. Your temperament interacts with other people over time, the environment naturally, but importantly, other people, then around the age of quote unquote, reason being developed, when we start to use language and interface with society in a way that conforms to reality to some respect, at least social reality, we begin to learn values and morals 
and virtues and knowing what other people want out of us in a more abstract way. That leads us to what most people would at least, I think, be happy to say is the adult personality or the teenage personality. Beautifully put. You're, it's very impressive how you... I'm not going to give you compliments. I don't feel like it. Don't worry about it. This may seem... Oh, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. No, I, I give lectures on this. I have lectures on this. So it's, yeah, but I've done still. i times. <laughs> okay, so to repeat, personality and pathology as a result of personality develops in particular constellations as a consequence of the interaction of a broad but finite range of instinctual needs, which is related to temperament, as you said, and the environment's ability or inability to respond to them. Oh, very nice. How do we, how do we like that? Much more concise and clear, I think, way of putting it. Yeah, though, ex instead of needs, I probably would say needs and tendencies. Right? Yeah. Needs and responses, ways of responding. Now, maybe, so that's why for... Oh, go on. No, you got it. So that's why for psychodynamic ways of conceptualizing the personality, many authors really just think of it as a pattern of defenses. And if that sounds too weird and archaic for you, think of it as a pattern of coping mechanisms, right? That's the personality. Yeah, and, and connecting it to, to history, we go back to Freud. We, we talked a little bit about how we view Freud in the previous podcast. Freud connected the drives and the instinctual needs, he connected those to like instinctual biological processes. So he oral, anal, phallic, which today sounds really silly, but the underlying theme there of developing internal needs, pressures, internal, you said something else besides needs that I liked. Responses. That concept is fundamental to how we understand it today. And today we've now added more of the needs and responses and systems including attachment systems, including the need to explore, the need to individuate. Essentially, a lot of people tacked on our, a better understanding of those needs without using the bizarre biological framework that Freud used. Yeah, I would say that's true from the standpoint of people who are still tuned into the psychodynamic, psychoanalytic end of things. I'm not necessarily sure that's how people talk or think about this kind of thing personality on the other end. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that unfortunately, there is a output focused way of looking at psychology and psychopathology. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's much more objective, measurable, scientific, if you will. But just take how they develop the ocean traits. So the ocean traits being openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. How they found those was that what they they actually started, I believe, from looking at just a huge dictionary of words that you might use to describe somebody. Okay, how would people generally describe somebody else? Take those words, group them into categories that are related to each other, and start to coalesce them into more umbrella categories that can be the master of the more abstract term for all the other words we use to describe someone. And they were able to find that there's more reliable, through observation of others and self-report, constructs of the ocean traits, O-C-E-A-N. That doesn't tell you about where it comes from, right? It doesn't necessarily have an eye towards development. And maybe that's responsible to say that these theories towards development are not set in stone scientific, even if they're very compelling and we have a lot of supporting data, if you look at it closely. Yeah, and I do want to point out the major limitations of the ocean traits is you can have, let's say you have someone's perfectly the percentile or whatever of each of their traits, how those traits actually play out is not at all understood within that theory. So you really can't understand a person's motives, the etiology, there's uh, the ocean traits have a limitation that the more psychoanalytic interpretations, actually, you better understand the behavior and you can predict some behavior. With the ocean traits, you can have two people with perfectly overlapped ocean traits and they'll have totally different uh, life stories. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. But it, again, it's because one side, let's say output researchers want to be scientific. They want to say, I'm not going to say anything I can't prove, right? Very responsible. So they're not going to comment on why 
someone does what they do. They're just going to comment on what is this person doing that I can show you objectively in some fashion, right? Yeah. Um, and that's responsible, but I think where we run into trouble is that there's that research and then there's lay people and clinicians who look at that and say why that person does what they do is because they're doing it, right? That's like saying, why is this person neurotic? Because they're neurotic. It's circular. Um, their neuroticism trait is very high. That's why they're doing that. No, they're, we know their neuroticism trait is high because they're doing it. That's what it's describing. Mm -hmm. We don't have a theory for why they're doing it just yet. Though we might, but it would have to take a different framework. Yeah, I think an extreme example would be Ted Bundy. If we knew all of his openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, <laughs> agreeableness, neuroticism, we would not predict that he would chop up bodies <laughs> Yes. and continue. The, inf the behavior does not flow from... You, you can't say, oh, he was a serial killer because he's low in agreeableness. Like that, there's a jump there that is That's unexplained. Right. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we're just too complicated to be explained in simple words. And then you can try to paint out someone's development and their habits and cobble it together, but it's pretty limited. By the way, I feel like we run the risk for this episode of getting too wonky. Let's get okay, wonky. I've been getting the impression that both of us are a little bit too in deep in terms of personality and personality pathology, and it could get, it's overly enthusiastic. We're, we're getting too particular. Yeah, I, I do get, I do forget that, yeah, uh, dynamic thought isn't. Not just dynamic. Again, I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know what most people mean by personality. Clinicians, clinicians, okay. My impression of what most people mean when they say personality or personality disorders is everything the person is doing on purpose and that I can hold him responsible, which is not what personality is. It's so much more than that. I don't know. What's your impressions so far in your life about how clinicians tend to conceptualize personality? Not based on an interview of these clinicians, of course, but looking at the phenomenon of when they recognize or talk about personality. Yeah. And when you, what you said, they're doing it on purpose, which mm -hmm. makes me cringe hard yeah. because so much of personality pathology intent, purposeness is not... It, it fades away when we're talking about things that people are driven to do. A lot of these things are unconscious. Yeah, and I, sorry, it's, it, when, in, in psychiatry, especially in the emergency room, if someone were to come up to you and go, oh, this is just personality, what, what they're mm -hmm. saying is that this, it's this person, is it's their fault. They have control over what they're doing. There, there's a sense of this person is manipulating you. Yeah. So in the emergency room, if someone comes in and says, I'm hearing voices, and then you talk to them and they're a little, a diff, they're difficult. It's a difficult interview. Afterwards, you'd say, oh, this is just personality, which implies, oh, this is not a, a bipolar manic process. This is not a, a psychotic process. This person is trying to get something from you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is almost like clinicians are saying, this is more of a Ted Bundy case. You know what I mean? It's cruel, I think, because to ascribe a volitional aspect purely to personality. No, I'm saying that wrong. To only say that volitional things are personality is really missing a lot of the fact that much of personality pathology is basically, at least from a subjective experience of the person, involuntary or compulsive in some fashion, right? Automatic. And of course, this would take a really drill down into the deep overview, which we shouldn't do today, but whether or not you do something on purpose is also not the same thing of whether or not you had control over it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, those things come into question whenever you're talking, when you see the more, the, the lower, uh, severe personality pathology and cases of, of Munchausen's, um, mm -hmm. where uh, these people are, are driven to really odd behaviors that I'm sure they can't understand. Yeah. What I worry about mostly is that I think people aren't taking the time to get in a little bit deep with personality. And because of the construction of the DSM traditionally, 
they see personality and personality disorders as this very constrained set of things in human life when really everybody has a personality everybody has personality traits and studies actually show that for both inpatient and outpatient clinical populations in psychiatry most people can meet criteria for a dsm personality disorder it doesn't mean that's not that's the main issue going on but i guess this is another problem with the good concept of diagnosis parsimony you, you ideally do not want to be trying to explain a patient's life and what they're doing with multiple different diagnoses if you can help it right yeah at the same time some people almost seem ideologically driven to say i'm going to identify one major controlling diagnosis and everything is going to be explained by that mm -hmm. and so i think that a lot of clinicians when they say this is personality what they're saying is, I feel like I have ruled out all axis one pathology. And therefore, I'm going to treat this person in a certain way. Or think about them or feel about them in a certain way. Yeah, sorry, I'm thinking about that. That's no, no, go for it. it. To go one step further, it's in a sense, like, if it's personality, this person has control over it. And there, there's a sense of feeling less responsible for treatment and mm -hmm. less typically less empathy for that patient yeah in, in a so. sense that it's like and we have kind of words that imply that cluster b if we say borderline what that implies is that this is a, a manipulative person and dismiss it's very dismissive yeah um, absolutely we can see this in just both the movement of the field and in individual clinicians. I remember one time was communicating about a shared patient with a therapist. And I mentioned that personality was higher in the differential. And the response that I got was, I don't like to jump to personality. Imagine if you said that about any other diagnosable psychiatric condition. Oh, I don't like to jump to bipolar. Oh, I don't like to jump to an eating disorder. I don't like to jump to an anxiety disorder. What does that mean? These are all things that you have to consider based on their relative um, share seen in the general population, right? You, you have to know what your chances are of running into something. And you also have to base your diagnosis on what you're seeing in front of you. Yet there is this reluctance. And I, I know why there's a reluctance. There's good reasons. It's because there is a stigma. It's a feedback loop. So I, I would love the field to get over it to understand that they are not looking at all personalities and they're reserving that diagnosis for patients they don't like, and they're doing harm to all patients because of that. Yeah, I remember a comment of like, I'll consider borderline when they're in their fifth emergency room visit for cutting or for suicide, suicide ideation, mm -hmm. and how problematic it is to only view personality as the most severe personality pathology that we understand it to be and mm -hmm. not respecting that there are people with severe personality pathology that are really quiet. And yeah. when I say quiet, isn't that yeah. there are problems that other people that affect other people and there are problems that occur only internally. A mm -hmm. lot of severe personality pathology, it's, it's an internal struggle. These people aren't manipulative, problematic, causing interpersonal, whatever. They're struggling internally. Yeah. And to only think of the most severe pathology as personality is missing how it's not understanding human beings and pathology in general. It's confusing. We can't blame people. I think that there's a problem where we try to just patchwork concepts across different frames of looking at human life and we run into trouble. It's the whole, is this on purpose or not thing, right? That's like a social or legal consideration about people and then they try to apply that to a clinical setting when in a clinical setting we don't diagnose to decide if something is purposeful or whether the patient is responsible right we're diagnosing to inform our treatment plan and to inform the patient of what are your treatment targets what's causing you problems right so but I also don't trust society to not patchwork those concepts across from each other and confuse them. I know it happens all the time in forensics. 
Mm -hmm. um, but in an ideal world, I think that we would more medicalize personality disorders for patients, but then we would also um, understand more broadly that in society, in society, understand as a society more broadly that if there is a medical condition, doesn't mean that they're not responsible. Yeah, it's moving the needle in both directions. Um, mm -hmm. That's yeah, integration, I, I would call. <laughs> I would call it integration of viewpoints. And it's very difficult on a social level, I think, um, let alone individual. Now, while you tell people to integrate, I'm going to tell people to disintegrate here. Um, okay. I think it's also helpful to understand, this is a little tangential from what we're talking about, that a person's pathology, if someone has a personality pathology or, or doesn't, it, it's not something that's on 24-7. Everyone has the ability to has like a mixed ability to function and that you you some people are operating with they meet they they're acting as if they have personality disorder at all times some people only get to a lower level of functioning when they're dealing with their key problems mm -hmm. or when they're under stress or if they're given very little support and i think it's best to try to empathize you can find these problems in yourself, if you try to be honest. Mm -hmm. Narcissistic problems are not to don't just occur with people with narcissistic personality disorder. We mm -hmm. every human being is dealing with narcissistic issues. And given in residency, when in second year, when I was under a ton of stress and I felt like I had very little support, I, you know, more problematic aspects of my personality came out. I started, there were aspects that I started splitting. And when I had a mentor, they were a great mentor mm -hmm. or they were and th these we all have the ability like common for residents not just very common for residents <laughs> um nice we all have the ability to operate at different levels of functioning and if you are honest with yourself you'll see that there's a ton of times in your lives that you regress during breakups that's a big one that people start acting a little borderline have more borderline tendencies Th those things come out it's it's not that you have high ego functioning and you're yeah. healthy defense mechanisms all the time or your low ego functioning we're all constantly changing depending on our environment that's right that's right that, that actually makes me think maybe that's why it's hard for people to accept personality as a pathology or to look at it accurately it's easy to say well, that person has a psychosis right that's very unlike what many what most of the population will go through in their lives mm -hmm. yet personality issues are so close to us Maybe if we recognize the milder versions as pathology, that requires us to understand ourselves as, in some sense, pathological, or that we have some room for improvement. That might be an uncomfortable thing for a lot of people. Yeah, but and as you're saying, I almost uh, I approach things with the opposite mentality that I, the way for me to better understand things is for me to get into the mindset and to understand it from an internal standpoint. I can understand narcissistic pathology because I'm able to put myself, you know, I'm able to see my own narcissistic struggles. I'm able to just understand borderline pathology by thinking about how I felt when I was undergoing a breakup and I said stupid things I didn't mm -hmm. intend. The The fix for that is I, I think you can really find yourself in nearly every single, because I guess you were saying like even psychosis, that, yeah, I guess that's a tougher one that do psychedelics. Everyone can be induced <laughs> into something like psychosis yeah. if we give you the right drugs. Yeah. But yeah. I think you're still right that generally speaking, the mind is capable of everything that the mind is capable of, right? Even if pathology is extremes of normality, every person can probably tap into something where they have felt at least something like it before, or even encountered it before in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. There's very little that is completely alien to the average person. Yeah. Even even one that's silly, psychopathy. The the way I, I can help tap into that is how do I treat objects? If I break an object, I feel nothing. Truly nothing. And if you told me mm -hmm. if you came up to me and said, How do you not care about that jar that you just broke? I can lie to you and say, Oh yeah, I got it. I feel bad for it. But I have no internal guilt. I have no no feelings towards if I cause damage to objects other than the way it impacts me. If I break my iPhone, all I care about is uh, this sucks for me. Yeah. Uh, 
Of course, so, I'm sure there are some people out there who feel very close to their objects who are just saying, this guy's a real psychopath right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. When a cop. Well, I like that example. I haven't thought of that before. I think that's a good way to help people get a little closer to that. Psychopathy is an interesting one. By the way, the literature on this topic is not uniform. So what people mean when they say psychopath or sociopath, you, you can't really reliably know what they mean. For my purposes, anytime I'm saying sociopath, someone who has not internalized or learned or developed the social ethics and values of whatever situation they're in, so that it causes a problem. And then a psychopath, I refer to something a little bit more fundamental. Some kind of a either lack of development or genetic um, predisposition towards not being able to perceive others as independent people and to feel that you can hurt them and have some responsibility towards them. That's what I mean by psychopathy. Yeah, and I, uh, to, to tack on to that, one thing that helped me to better understand it is when I, the classical people you think of as psychopaths, Ted Bundy's, all, all that. The, they have what you just described with something on top of it, which is sadism and mm -hmm. high, like the average psychopath isn't chopping up bodies. They're not, yeah. it's just that if they were to do that, they wouldn't feel it, but they're not also driven to do sadistic things. The serial killers are psychopaths and sadistic, whereas your average psychopath is not wreaking that kind of havoc because they don't have a drive to those we, behaviors. We think so anyway, that's our hypothesis. And I can take this opportunity to malign our great colleagues in surgery. They are chopping up people and feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm kidding there. That, that's though a good example to show how traits of psychopathy or at least ability to not react with significant negative feelings when you potentially harm somebody or actually have to harm them for some greater cause is adaptive. It's necessary in society. Surgeons being one small example of many different jobs where you're put in uncomfortable positions, but that if that job didn't exist, things might go awry. Yeah. And everyone in the medical field has some degree of, to be able to get through medical school and residency, you have to have some degree of turning off those empathetic responses in order to do those, the things that you need to do to help that person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Though I also think that this is where a lot of lay people and clinicians run to trouble with social policy and clinical treatment of truly psychopathic antisocial people in that they think that these people are doing what they're doing because some awful thing happened to them so that they have to turn it off the same way that they themselves turn off those responses under stress. Sometimes that's the case. I wouldn't call those people actually antisocial or psychopathic. But a lot of these people who chronically harm others or violate their rights, I think they are lacking innately that sense of guilt and remorse. And then you have to manage people like that very differently than somebody who does have the capacity for guilt and caring for others. Sorry, I didn't. Sometimes I have a tough time in the moment get understanding. So you're saying that psychopaths absolutely lack the ability, and then there are some people who are able to turn it on and off, given the situations. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that we should reserve the term psychopathy for people who have a true innate impairment, not just a psychological problem, when it comes to feeling remorse, guilt, and concern for others. Mm -hmm. I I think it's a sliding scale. I think there's various degrees of feeling strongly or weakly about it. And you might have someone who feels guilt if they break a mug. I'm sure those <laughs> people exist. I've met them. <laughs> and then you might have, as we said, Ted Bunn, right? It's a wide sliding scale. And somewhere in the middle, you have maybe a slightly problematic, but still talented and productive CEO somewhere, right? Or a politician mm -hmm. somewhere. It's a murky, America. broad category. Now, th that this that the point you just made actually makes me want to ask a question that hopefully, yeah, I want you to talk. <laughs> I almost want you to give the answer that I'm thinking in my head, but I think that you'll say it better. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll hear people say, is this borderline or is this narcissism? Um, because they'll see someone who has typical borderline traits, but they have when you actually there's a lot of things that we typically associate with narcissism. And then I guess on, on your point, you'll see someone who is, they're acting just like a narcissist, but then they have what I would consider psychopathic traits and that they don't care about others. Can you talk about how 
why, how you can understand why are these borderlines acting narcissists? Why are these narcissists acting borderline? Why are these narcissists acting psychopathically? Yeah, now I'm curious about what your answer is, but I would my answer is that those questions fundamentally exist because the personality disorder categories as described in the DSM are terrible in in the primary section, not the alternative model, by the way. Section three of the DSM five has an alternative model that I think is very good and that people should be really familiar uh, fami that people should be really familiarizing themselves with. I can't remember the exact stats. There's been research where if you meet criteria for one named DSM personality disorder, the traditional type, you have a very high likelihood of meeting criteria for a second. Okay. These categories are just ways to describe people. And since there's a lot of shared underlying issues that are producing the DSM diagnosis, then comorbidity suddenly becomes the rule rather than the exception. This is very similar to what we see with, for example, major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, right? Supposedly different categories, but very comorbid, maybe because they have similar base causes. Uh, similar thing, for example, of intellectual disability and psychotic disorders. There's actually a threefold higher risk of developing a schizophrenia if you have an intellectual disability. Is that because maybe we're artificially categorizing them as different things based on output, when really there's a lot of shared genetic basis or um, shared mechanism. Who knows? Mm -hmm. We still need to research. But that's why categorizing personality simply by traits is insufficient, right? And if we look at the alternative model, or for example, the work from the Personality Disorders Institute with Kernberg and the Borderline Personality Organization, organization, not disorder, these people would all fall under the category of having an impaired personality. They have a personality disorder writ large or impaired personality functioning, and then different traits can come out. And whether or not they're psychopathic, we can have an individual assessment of that based on their level of guilt capacity and their moral and ethical development. Yeah, and I do want you to talk more about the alternative model. Um, we talked about it a little bit, but if you go in more detail. Oh, yeah. Briefly, it is on the DSM-5-TR, it's page 882, concise, readable. Instead of saying, what are the different criteria that will bring us to, in terms of symptoms, bring us to one personality disorder diagnosis, they ask you instead to assess for and rate the level of personality dysfunction, how much impairment in personality functioning do you see? They break down personality functioning into two major subcategories with four total elements. There's the self-functioning, which is your identity functioning and your self-direction. And then there's interpersonal, which is empathetic, empathy, em empathy functioning, and intimacy, relationships. Okay, that's what a personality disorder is proper. Of course, under this model, we probably have to acknowledge as well that Certain things like the cluster A personalities may not really be a personality disorder. Maybe they are, but they're probably a little closer genetically to psychosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess I guess I'll take a second to answer how I formulated and connect to those things. And that uh, the the way that I understand, and I think this aligns more with the the personality alternative personality model. Essentially, cer certain pathologies develop out of problems in a certain developmental period. And I understand borderline issues stemming from uh, issues with attachment and bonding, which occurs earlier than issues of the self and development of like self and others. Um, so if you have a problem that occurs earlier in development, then it's more likely that you're going to have problems subsequently in other developmental areas. With someone with a borderline pathology is going to have issues with self-esteem as a result of the fact that they went into that developmental phase at a disadvantage in some sense. I, I don't think it's as linear as age one, this occurs, age two, this occurs. I think it's more complicated than that. But I, I guess I understand it as if, if you have tru trouble with one sector of functioning, when the next developmental period comes, you're going to have trouble with that one, more likely to have trouble with that one as well. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with that major point, right? That if you're impaired or you undergo any kind of impairment or trauma early on, that's going to color your later development and your ability to withstand further stressors and problems in your life. Only thing that might change in terms of what you said is that I would probably go as far as to say that the only things that we should consider personality disorders are things that would fit under the category of borderline per personality organization. organization. Yeah. In terms of cluster C personality problems, I would sooner just talk about those as sub thresholds way sub threshold ways of manifesting risk factors for named DSM disorders, avoidant personality, right? And dependent personality are a little bit more, to me, milder versions of anxiety and depressive disorders, especially the anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. OCPD would be probably some, I would theorize, I don't know actually if we have the data for this, a sub threshold or risk factor manifestation of the obsessive and compulsive and related disorders, right? And then naturally the cluster A would be the genetic cousins, the prodromes, the risk factors to the psychotic disorders. I do see what you're saying, and I partially disagree with it, especially with OCPD. With OCD, there's, I don't, I don't have a, I think actually, Nancy McWilliams has talked about this, that some with OCD, there's an ego, dis, their symptoms are ego dystonic, and that if, if you were to say, like, why are you doing that? They would get very upset about the fact that they're doing it. Someone who has OCPD, there's fundamental problems of safety with regards to their symptoms and that their odd behaviors. I think she talks about how there's a woman who would boil the sheets every single night for her kids. So after her kids went to sleep, she would go and boil the, the sheets. And when she said, Is that, isn't that a little odd? The woman responded as if she was a like someone who was attacking her. And it's, what do you mean? You have to, don't you care about your kids? Um, and that she interpreted the, the response, that's a little odd, as very intrusive, as like getting underneath her fundamental safety. So that there was mm -hmm. core issues in the woman's development of, of self that had her have the OCPD symptoms, not, um, I guess, what I would view as like yeah. Her. No, that's valid. I, I think that's definitely true when we think about DSM categories of OCD and OCPD. Because OCPD, all the personality disorders in traditional DSM, require you to have some measure of interpersonal dysfunction or distress, right? And when it comes to OCPD, the way it's constructed, people with OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, they like their symptom by definition. And so therefore you lose all the people who don't like their symptom still have OCPD traits and are not so aggressive that they would come to clinical attention for this problem. So mm. that's what I'm trying to capture there. That yeah. I do think there's, I, I hypothesize, my suspicion is that there's a underlying genetic or temperamental trend towards obsessionality. And yes, some small proportion of that group will convert to OCD. Some small proportion of that group will convert to OCPD. And the rest of them will simply exist in the population. All right, that wraps up part one of this discussion. We got part two coming out next week. Some other things maybe you want to check out. I did make a video course on treating depression. If you just go to psycho.farm, so not .com, but .farm. Also a book on treating depression that's on Amazon. Just search Psycho Farm Malsberg. It should come up. And if you like the podcast, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Got to give a shout out to some wonderful people. Uh, Air Force Psych, Acorn Bearer. And we appreciate all the people who wrote nice things in their comments. So shout out to Ken Hayes, Rim559, BenZap1, one of our favorite people, Frickle Sue 2350 Jap Matt, and Good Psychiatry. So yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, consider leaving a review or a comment. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you back next week to finish this discussion.